Today's Beginner's Guide to Tetsujin 28 covers all of its anime entries and provides a recommended watch order. They're all about a young boy, usually named Shotaro, with a 28-ton remote-control robot clobbering bad guys. The general idea is that Shotaro's father was one of the engineers creating the Tetsujin line of war machines intended for use in World War II. This is their 28th and final model. This is the introduction I wish I had when I began Tetsujin 28, 1963. Similar to the 60s Cyborg 009 and Gekigen no Kitaro, there's no introduction. It starts right in the middle of the story. Literally. The English localization Gigantor even begins on episode 42 of the 98 episode original, a fact I didn't know until I decided to rewatch the entire anime raw. Sadly, the original isn't any different despite being twice its length. It's just a poor introduction that assumes you've read the manga, though the dialogue possibly added extra context. Nevertheless, the story we get is a bi-episode revolving door of war-themed world domination villains with tanks and mechanical dinosaurs. The parts that interested me the most were the other Tetsujin models, since they're the closest we got to visual exposition. Not to mention the English localization took heavy liberties with its dialogue. I guess it could be fun for anyone with a guilty pleasure for bad dubs, but its novelty wears off after a few episodes, unlike its closest competitors, Astro Boy and Ape Man, both from 1963. In fact, even the original Japanese version pales in comparison to these anime as they both feel more mature. If you haven't seen my beginner's guides, they're both comical and action-packed, but Astro offers valuable anti-war, racism, and government corruption messages to name a few. Although Ape Man wasn't nearly as thematically mature, it offers the most intense action, dynamic recurring villains, and an adult protagonist. Comparatively, both versions of Tetsujin 28 1963 feel like a vapid Saturday morning cartoon for their rinse and repeat conflicts. Sure, their enemies wear military uniforms, but there's no message that I could infer. Although meaningless action doesn't inherently make an anime bad, 1963 does little to compensate and its age isn't helping. Overall, I give the original Tetsujin 28 a 5 out of 10. I did not enjoy watching it, and I can't recommend it unless you're a vintage anime otaku. Even then, it's one of my least favorite 60s anime, so there are far better options. Thankfully, its 1980 reimagining offers much of the same nonsensical antics, but with a more palatable platform. There's also more detailed characters, a subtle overarching story, and beautiful visuals remastered in HD. Now Shotaro returns as an independent orphan living in a log cabin in the woods next to his girlfriend. While 1963 offered little structure for the franchise, the 1980 reimagining benefits from having a clean slate. Instead of being purely episodic, its plot is structured similarly to modern episodic anime of the same length. It alternates between recurring villains and total absurdity in its first half, followed by a linear arc introducing mysterious enemies threatening the planet. Unfortunately, this freedom also hinders it regarding its characters, a recurring constraint prevalent in most entries, considering they're rarely fleshed out and exist purely for brand recognition. Despite this, I actually enjoyed several of the antagonistic characters introduced around the halfway point. Unlike our main characters, there's some complexity and drama to their backstory, along with moral ambiguity to keep things interesting. Thankfully, the main appeal of 1980 isn't its story or characters. It's the total absurdity of its episodic content. It's so quirky and unpredictable that I'd almost put it into the same category as Daitarn 3. It pits the Tetsujin up against mummies, vampires, zombies, the Grim Reaper, and more. There's even time travel. Another of its strong points are its visuals. This is the only Tetsujin series with an HD remaster, and I'm glad because I enjoyed its early 80s aesthetic. Interestingly, this was the first time artist and animator Maeda Minoru worked on an anime and was also his only role as mechanical designer. As a result, we get some pretty unique looking mechs. Although this was Minoru's only mech anime, you've likely enjoyed his works without realizing it, considering he was the animation director and character designer for much of the Dragon Ball anime franchise. 
I didn't go back and watch any Gundam or Macross remasters to verify this, but my first reaction was that this was probably my favorite early 80 mech anime in terms of color and picture clarity. Overall, I give Tetsujin 28 1980 a 7.5 out of 10 for its visuals and oddly enjoyable nonsensical plot. Thankfully, this remaster is available on Blu-ray from Discotech, who recently licensed all of the Tetsujin anime for physical release, minus 1963, and I don't blame them. Unfortunately, there's another Astro Boy situation, and if you've seen my guide to that and read my top comment, you'll understand. I began this project about four months ago with an expected completion date of mid-December, but it just didn't work out that well because of other projects and things going on in life, but it was mostly done. The script was mostly done by then, and I unfortunately had to watch Tetsujin 28 1992 Raw because there was no English translation beyond the first episode, and around the time that I was almost done with it, lo and behold, there is news for the discotheque release of the Blu-ray for that, and this is a really uncomfortable situation for me because it still hasn't come out yet. It comes out towards the end of the month, and I don't want to hold up the 1960s project anymore, so I'm just going to tell you what I thought about watching it raw, and I still thought it was pretty good. I still thought uh, it was I was capable of understanding things through the visual context and whatnot, but uh, definitely don't watch it raw if you don't speak Japanese. The 90s anime is a sequel to the original following Shotaro's son in command of a new and period-appropriate Tetsujin 28 model. Thankfully, you don't need to watch the original to understand the sequel because the basics are covered through flashbacks. All I can reliably say is that its story is a mostly linear narrative with a few unexpected events featuring many colorful and quirky characters. Some side characters even undergo dramatic character development. However, what surprised me the most about Tetsujin FX was how similar its aesthetics were to the Yusha franchise. I mean, look at this. To me, this feels like its designs and transformations were created by the same people who worked on the Yusha franchise, but sadly, I couldn't find any link on anime databases. I was also surprised to discover stereotypical nation-themed mechs similar to G Gundam and a mech controlled by a guitar like Macross 7. However, Tetsujin FX predates both those anime. More than anything, FX makes me curious about earlier mech anime since my understanding is so limited and there may have been a few common influences. Maybe Transformers uh, Super God Master Force could have been one of them? I don't know. While it's unfair for me to give Tetsujin 28 FX an official review score, uh, it felt like a 7.5, and, and it could be higher, but you know, the language, I'll rewatch it whenever I get the Blu-ray, and it'll probably be higher, since I enjoyed watching the original Tetsujin, uh, the machine, in color for the first time. I enjoyed seeing Shotaro as an adult, as a father, and he's like, his character, his personality really mellowed out a lot, and I liked seeing how the uh, side characters developed, because it was pretty dramatic and intense scenes, from what I can tell, from the visual context. Uh, just some of the twists and turns in the plot and whatnot. It seemed really interesting, so I'm looking forward to that. But this is the most I can say, having seen it only raw. Comparatively speaking, Tetsujin 28 2004 is the most faithful to the original anime, but it just overhauls everything, creating a more serious and emotional experience. It basically takes the original premise of the story and some of the ideas behind some of its arcs and gives it a more modern and serious spin that I think has the most mass appeal out of anything in the franchise. My favorite aspect of 2004 was the importance it placed on Shotaro's background, building mystery around his father's work. Admittedly, it's the first time in the franchise I felt interested in its iconic characters because they were fleshed out and had a purpose greater than pure recognition value. Additionally, its anti-war themes are more pronounced, asking whether someone's intent makes something a tool or a weapon, and whether that justifies its production. These issues circle in Shotaro's head as he questions his resolve and efficacy. 2004 also overhauls its side characters, focusing on their dramatic stories throughout several mini-arcs, fitting neatly within its overarching linear plot. 
Although I enjoyed the importance of Shotaro's history, I preferred most of its side characters, especially Kenji, a pacifist who often finds himself at odds with Shotaro over his views on weapons. Despite their stark ideological differences, Kenji understands Shotaro isn't fully aware of the history he supports. Unfortunately, this degree of writing prowess was inconsistent in its second half. For starters, episodes 12 through 16 were enjoyably dramatic yet out of place for being the only episodic one-off stories featuring new and inconsequential characters. It felt like the narrative build-up screeched to a halt for a few episodes, preventing me from enjoying them to their fullest and causing concern over if the main plot would continue. Its main plot returns in episode 17, beginning with unnecessary foreshadowing that literally spoils its ending. If you'd like to avoid this, skip past its opening to around 2 minutes 14 seconds and you should be fine. It makes me question their thought process considering its final arc is saturated with uninteresting yet convoluted villains and an underwhelmingly abrupt conclusion. Although its final episodes featured some intense battles with the most mechs on screen at once, the entire 2004 franchise was consistently the most beautiful and well animated in the franchise. I loved how they illustrated the duality of tool and weapon in Tetsujin, giving him this ominous aura in several episodes. The severity of these conflicts is further depicted by low camera angles contrasting the size of fragile humans against massive, hulking war machines. 2004 also displays the brutal nature of war through robots struggling against each other in hand-to-hand -hand combat, destroying parts of their body in the process. Its combat feels raw and visceral in ways that many other anime with lasers and swords lack. Overall, Tetsujin 28 2004 isn't perfect, but it's intense, mysterious, and emotional enough for many to enjoy. I give it a 7.5 out of 10. You may also enjoy its spin-off movie Tetsujin 28 Hakuchu no Zangetsu. It follows the 2004 anime but branches off, forming its own timeline around the halfway point. Superficially, I think it's an enjoyable movie primarily for its beautiful presentation. I don't know about you, but if I feel underwhelmed by an anime's ending, I expect any subsequent content to rectify these issues, like with Macross 7 Dynamite 7. Otherwise, it's a misguided effort, like putting rims on a hoopty. So if you're going to make an anime after an anime ends and the ending is underwhelming, maybe they didn't think it was underwhelming in Japan, but I did. I think that movie could go and flush out a lot of characters. We need an epilogue or something for this because it kind of just ends and it's so abrupt and I didn't like that. I don't consider that a spoiler. I'm just preparing you. I'm not telling you exactly what happens or anything, but don't worry. Episode 17 will. I digress, the 2007 Tetsujin movie offers nothing to its source material but thematically appropriate yet redundant anti-war messages. I would say it's almost detrimental as it's a what-if scenario imagining if Shotaro's father adopted a son and intended for him to be the pilot. I felt this contradicts his underlying love and desperation that motivated him to create a war machine out of hope for the future in the anime series. I give the Tetsujin 28 movie a 6 out of 10. It's a fun watch if you don't have any eccentric hang-ups about the 2004's conclusion. Overall, each entry in the Tetsujin franchise is good for its time and most are still enjoyable today. As for my recommended watch order, it relates to your taste since most follow popular trends for its period. If you love late 70s mech anime like Die Tarn 3, then you'll enjoy 1980. If you love Yusha and 90s Gundam aesthetic, then the 1992 anime is for you. However, the average viewer will likely enjoy the 2004 anime the most for its visuals, characters, lore, and shorter episode count. Lastly, if you think you'll hate the anime and don't want to try it, I'd recommend the 2007 spin-off movie since it contains the essence of Tetsujin and is well animated, though you'll have to skip its opening since it spoils the ending of the 2004 series. However, it will at least familiarize you with the franchise without requiring any serious time commitment. Since I'm ad-libbing so much of this video already, I may as well add something that I don't know how I forgot, because it's Kind of hilarious in a bad way, but Tetsujin 28's protagonist, Shotaro, the 10-year-old boy, is the origin for the term Shotakon. If you don't know what that is, 
Google it, but you're probably going to be added to some sort of list for doing that. But so basically the term Shotokan was originated in 1981 in a magazine. Uh, I couldn't find any further context to that in the Wikipedia page that I read because I did not want to investigate further because there's probably some extra context out there. I'm just too afraid to find it. And maybe it's a joke. Maybe people were upset that they changed his character design from this to this, or it could have just been something that changed over the time that was totally innocent in the beginning. Maybe because Shotaro was like a template for further anime characters from that point since he was as generic as they come. But I don't know. It is what it is. And Shotokon is Shotaro complex stuffed together. And now you know. Thanks for watching and thanks to Nia-chan and everyone listed here for their Patreon support. I'll see you soon with the Beginner's Guide to Jungle Taitei.